And that's it, really. And now, tiny touch days. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so hello, good evening. Uh, it's really cool to see so many people actually here. Um, to, before we start, just to get a quick overview, uh, I would like to see some hands. Uh, do you play games? Please raise your hands. Ah, that's good. Okay, so then please raise your hands if you make games already. Oh, that's quite a lot. Okay. Uh, and please raise your hands if you would like to make games. Okay, so maybe, yeah, some shy hands. Okay, that's cool. So maybe this talk is for you because uh, I try to find an interesting topic and I want to talk about making games without coding. So maybe for the ones that are more into the artist side or more into the design side, this is something for you. So we want to start with who is Tiny Touch Tales. Um, short introduction. So Tiny Touch Tales is basically Wiebke Rauers and Arnold Flöck, which is me. So we're a Berlin-based duo and we're both right now working in uh, full time in our respective fields, which is uh, illustration and character design for Wiebke and for me, uh, game and interface design. Um, at Tiny Touch Tales, the roles that we have in our real life is almost the same. And one thing that's special though about us is that we don't have a program in our team. And now you may ask yourself, okay, how the hell do they make games when they don't have a programmer? And this is a question we want to answer later. Uh, Tiny Touch Tales, uh, the name is a direct translation of our vision statement. As you can see right now, we are focusing on iOS and on uh, touchscreen devices. Um, we believe that mobile gaming is the most accessible for all sorts of players. This is why we are want to uh, explore more of the touchscreen interface and um, for us it has the most potential and we just simply love the touch interfaces. So to get you started, what have we made? Um, we were like founded or we started around August 2012 and right now we have four projects that are released and we want to give you a short overview of them. So on the top left starting is Super Zombie Tennis, which was released in August 2012. Uh, the, the next one was Muffin Munch, which was released in December 2012. Then we made a game called Metchagon, which uh, was released in March 2013. And the latest project just released last Wednesday is a uh, not, not directly a game, but it's an interactive storybook for kids, uh, which is called Cut Means Colorful Moon Story. And to give you a brief overview, I made some GIFs for you to look at. Um, so as you can see, just quick on the top left, Super Zombie Tennis is some kind of uh, shooter-based game where you have to avoid the incoming waves of zombies, but it also features some kind of tower defense where you have different defense states and you have a basic leveling system for boosts uh, like ice balls and fireballs and all that cool kind of stuff. Uh, Muffin Munch is a kids oriented matching game where you have to uh, combine same colored muffins and let them grow and if they have grown enough they like explode in joy and you can get points for them. Um, then Matchagon is also a kind of a matching game. It's a combination between Tetris and Match 3 actually and you have different rules. Uh, you have to combine blocks either vertically to raise the block multiplier uh, and to score points you have to remove them horizontally or diagonal. So, uh, and this game is cool because you're basically fighting yourself and you're fighting your own mess all the time, which is, which is pretty, pretty intense, or can be pretty intense sometimes. So, and I said the la as I said, the um, last thing is the, the children's book for the iPad for kids from two to four, which has a self-written story and which integrates also some little games inside the narrative. And it answers the question, uh, why do we see the moon sometimes at day? So these are our release games, and, but also we love game jams and uh, we personally think that game jams are the best environment for making games because game jams naturally restrict you in your, in your thoughts, in your ideas, so you really have to boost your creativity to make something really small normally in a really short time frame. And there are a lot of game jams all around the world. For example, the Global Game Jam, that is a yearly game jam, it's a 48 hour game jam and this is uh, a game we made to the theme Uroboros, which was uh, 2012. Uh, it's the self-biting snake, the symbol of the self-biting snake. And this is a game about a guy stuck in the office in an endless loop, and he has to enter the office through an elevator, and then he has to run through the office and exits the office through the elevator. But instead of like arriving at the, at the 
the exit floor he arrives at the at the same floor again and has to do the same thing all over and the the second day his run from the first day appears as a ghost and is haunting him so at the end of the week there are like four ghosts haunting you and they are all the replays of the games that you played before and the only way to win this game is to die basically so then another thing which is pretty cool is Ludum Dare. I don't know, maybe some of you have already heard of it. It's a super uh, big game jam uh, all over the world, also mainly uh, on the internet. It's a, also a 48-hour game jam, which takes place every three months. Uh, and this is from uh, Ludum Dare 25. This was uh, around December, I think. And the theme here was You Are the Villain. And in this game, it's about you are infected by a bacteria and uh, it has some kind of swapping mechanic where you can swap different colored bacteria and they uh, basically combine to the opposite. So yellow and red means green, green and yellow means red, and uh, green and red means yellow. And you have to remove all the red ones from your game board. And if you don't manage to do so, they, they die. And they and the next day, basically the next run through, they are there as a, as a black uh, blocker. And the, the game ends when you have more than five red bacteria in your body. And then another Ludum Dara game just recently, Ludum Dara 26, the theme was minimalism, uh, where we made a super fast uh, rock, paper, scissor. Uh, and it's a basic, basic avoider game where you have to kill the, the uh, cyan colored shapes. But the, 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 the idea behind it is that when you kill the uh, enemy or the, the ones that you can kill, you absorb them in a way and you become the shape itself. So every time you kill something, the whole relation to the enemies changes. And uh, this made, made up a really interesting challenge if you want to be fast and uh, want to kill a lot of uh, shapes. So and then one thing uh, which also was pretty interesting, the stencil game jam, uh, which took place also in uh, 2013, in, in uh, April, where we made a game uh, which was based on the idea that I had a long time ago. And it's basically a, uh, it's hopefully the world's first uh, turn-based puzzle platformer where you uh, have to control the player passively by changing the gravity into uh, up, down, left and right. So you're, you're basically changing the gravity for the level and the player has to uh, fall basically with the gravity and then you can see you have traps and breaking things and uh, you have to collect those golden skulls and you have obviously like a limited move uh, uh, amount of limited moves that you have to uh, keep track of so and this game will, ex will actually be the next game and to give you a small glimpse of what Wiebke is actually doing. She's doing the illustration and the uh, world for the games. And this game, as you see it in the pixelated version where I did it really quick, she will do a full-fledged version with the cool characters. And we hopefully will make a cool match-up between Mononoke and Zelda for the, for the style. So, and uh, if you're interested in game jams, you should, should check out compuhub.net, which is the best site to keep track of all the game jams that are upcoming. and. Uh, yeah, you can keep track of them. So, Are there any cool game jams in Berlin? Yeah, Berlin mini game jam. <laughs> I think so. You should uh, attend, but we already had that. <laughs> so, um, right. So, okay. So now comes the interesting questions. How do we make our game? So, um, I say in the last five years, maybe it got really easy to make games because there are a lot of game making tools out there that you can pick up and directly start making stuff. And this is just a small list of like really well-known game making tools like Unity or Game Maker. But for me personally, all those tools uh, have one thing in common, which is you have to have at least a little bit experience in coding or in, in text-based coding. So, and uh, even though it's only a scripting language like Game Maker script, you have to type and code stuff. So, and this is uh, around the beginning of 2000. 2012, where I found a game making tool called Stencil, and Stencil uh, is a pretty awesome game making tool because it's based on another game making tool which is called Scratch. And Scratch was um, built for elementary school kids to learn programming. It's built by the MIT, it's like a pretty known thing. And it uses a visual programming engine to create the logic that we need in games. So, what Stencil can do is actually turn this for me as a non-programmer and designer and like really scary looking pile of code into this, which is 
pretty straightforward, easy to understandable Lego block-like structure. So, and Stancy uses uh, those kind of blocks that snap into each other, into into each other, uh, and is mainly or like completely independent of writing actual text-based code. So, and just last week I had a big argument with a colleague, a program colleague. He said, "Oh no, this is programming too. It's just a visual representation instead of a text-based one." And I say, "Yes, it is. It's still programming." But it's way easier to understand for beginners, and it's super easy to learn the basic of how game logic works. And in the end, yes, you still have to understand what, for example, an if statement is, or what an x or y coordinate is, but it releases the pressure of having writing wrong syntax or confronting you with complex and inconvenient class and variable structures and all that kind of stuff that you actually don't need in the first place to understand how to make games. So, which is and, and which is obviously the hardest part when you have to start learning a programming language. So to just give you a quick glimpse, I have also uh, made a nice GIF demo of this. So this is the interface for building code. So you have this uh, library of blocks that you can like drag and drop, and you can uh, have different uh, structures. For example, you have a normal if structure where you uh, can drag and drop those uh, operators, for example, if the x position of the player is greater than what I've done, the screen width, then I want the actor, to, um, the, the, the player to move to the left side of the screen, and if the uh, x position of the, so the horizontal position on the screen of the player is smaller than the screen width, then I want to move him back to the right side so I have a nice back and forth moving of the player. And that, that's all. So this would work. You can attach it to a player and you would do that stuff that you just uh, put in here. So stands the interface. Um, just a short overview of what the tool itself also offers. Um, and what is... I don't know if that's that's super like new or whatever, but it uses a metaphor for making games, which is some kind of theater or movie metaphor, where all the stuff that live inside your game, so players, uh, environment, interactive uh, blocks, all the graphics are represented as an actor, and the scene uh, is the the level where the actor lives in. And um, then behaviors are the logic that are attached either to the scenes or to the actors. And you basically have some kind of object structure here that is packed nicely in a easy to understand metaphor. Um, right, and, and to, to uh, give you a showcase um, of what the interface looks like, so you have some overview of all your actors in games. So these are all the graphics that you need that you turn into real living game objects. Um, you have a interface for having animations. For example, for the uh, player, you can give him different animation states where you can import your bitmap, uh, sprite sheets or whatever, the animation that you did in the graphics program. Um, then the scene overview shows you the, the scenes and the scenes is a metaphor for, it could be like the selection screen of your game, it could be uh, the start screen, it could be the actual levels which you build where the, the game happens. And to build levels, Stencil has a implemented uh, level building system where you also have your actors and you can drag and drop the actors into the scene and you can really quickly build a level and test the level. Uh, and you can see it has, it has also uh, a Photoshop-like layer structure where you can uh, layer stuff on top of each other to have some nice uh, depths in your scenes if you would like to have that kind of stuff. And then obviously the, the heart of the thing are the behaviors. And as I said, behaviors can be either attached to actors or they can attach, be attached to the scenes. And um, yeah, the, the behaviors are basically the logic bits that make the player jump, walk, or die if he falls in a pit or whatever. So, and um, don't be scared, this is a pretty advanced behavior. They look like this, but still, if you, if you are more used to visual interfaces, and that's where I come from, so I'm, I'm a designer, uh, I think those representations of coding is, is, or this representation of coding is way more understandable if you once get behind the system. And it's actually pretty quick. So programming with Stencil is super fun, and I, I would say you have your first running and jumping character in less than an hour. Um, what is also really cool about Stencil itself is the community. 
and which split into uh, two parts. And part one is the Stencil Forge, where you can download pre-made behaviors for your game. So you can uh, look there, and if you're looking for something specific, for example, you want to have a behavior for a spaceship that can move in all eight directions, you just go there, look for it, because in 95% of the time, somebody else already did it, and you just have to download the behavior and attach it to your spaceship. And um, yeah, you basically have your spaceship moving in all eight directions really quick. So the second thing is the, the forum. It's has, it has a super friendly forum. It's, it's, it's a relatively small forum, I would say, but therefore the people are super active and people help you normally within the 12, next 12 hours, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and it also has a ton of solved problems already where you just have to search for, for your problem. So to sum it up, Stencil helps you with the very first steps in creating games. Um, if you have never touched any programming language, Visual Block Building Interface explains you everything step by step and is super easy to use. Uh, the concept of how games are assembled is super easy to learn in this tool. There are no complex things like classes, super functions, inheritance and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it offers integrated tools for animations, uh, it has a built-in level editor, it has a super great community and you can download it in the basic uh, version for free where you can export Flash, which is also something I should mention. It's based on a, a cross-compiler language called Hakes NME and it can, if you make a game, you can compile the stuff into Flash, HTML5, iOS, Android, Mac native, Excel native, everything. So. Sure, every platform has its specific hiccups and you have to optimize, but we did all our iOS games with this tool. So uh, where you can find us? Um, we are in the internet, obviously, so the main, the main resource would be our homepage, tinytouchdesk.com, and also if you like social networks, you can find us on the social networks. Uh, if you want to contact us, contact us directly, you can either choose one of our email addresses and uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yeah. Um, like, if, if this is such a visual representation of, of coding, mm -hmm. and your friend or something said, like, this is this like coding? Do you, do you have the feeling like, okay, now I know a little bit of coding and I want to switch to something else? Uh, yeah, it's a good starting point. That's 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 the main thing. And the cool thing is, Stencil supports real coding also, right? So this is this is no must to use the the blocks. The whole engine is also capable of uh, getting like Hake's real code, for example. So this is no problem. And you can also, if you're even more advanced, you can inject Objective C, JavaScript, whatever. So it has a really uh, open like framework for for injecting code. Yeah. Okay, you just prefer, you prefer the, 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 the framework? Correct. So yeah, correct. Be used. Yeah, because because I got used to it so quickly because of the building with the blocks and stuff. I know that, for example, Unity also has visual programming, but it's not as convenient as this super simple uh, layout. Because I think the main the main thing is because it was developed actually to teach children. It's so super simple even though we are not children anymore, but for people starting out and me, I have a small technical background, but I never got into coding at all. And with this tool, I, I don't know, I made 10 games in the last year or whatever. So it's like, re it's really easy. It sounds like, a, let's a little bit sound like a sellout here, but it's really, I really love that tool. And that's, <laughs> that's why I can really uh, say it's really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Unity uh, features, the, how do they call it? Um, they also have this asset store thing, and then you have these plugins, and they have visual programming plugins there. Uh, play, Playmaker, for example, this is the biggest one. That's very cool, because um, so far I didn't know yet. Yeah. I'm using Unity on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they also in the, in the yeah, asset store, I think it's called asset store, they have a lot of visual programming. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? No? Okay. No. Please. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, 
3D. <laughs> so if you want to make a 3D game, then you should go for a 3D engine because it's a 2D engine. I saw some concepts where people actually tried to have a fake 3D, like the old Doom or whatever. But yeah, right. It's it's basically a, a 2D engine. And right now, I mean, I maybe I haven't come up with a co enough complex game to fail, but right now I could not say anything that's not doable in 2D, actually. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you said you can inject uh, like Objective-C or something like that, so then when you can't do something with a native code, you can do it with uh, some other code. Right, object. correct, yeah. I mean, normally you can always go for the, for the native code stuff if you want to support something like... I mean, it even has, for example, iOS, it even has Game Center and all that stuff integrated, so that works, like, without... Anything. Yeah, please. Can you do any kind of multiplayer with it? Or it uh, oh yeah, that's a good that's a good thing. So there are people pulling off multiplayer, but it's turn based, uh, which HTTP requests stuff. So it's no real time multiplayer actually. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. How does the licensing work? Uh, yeah, licensing works like this. You have a free license where you can build Flash uh, and also test in iOS. <coughs> Uh, then you have a, they have some kind of indie license, which is $150 a year. And then you can go for a studio license, which is $300 a year, which supports everything basically. So, and it removes the uh, branding stuff. Yeah. So there's branding stuff if you don't take, if you don't subscribe to the studio. Correct, yeah. You will get branded by the dev. <coughs> just a small preloader. It's not nothing like watermarked or whatever. It's just a preloader before your game starts. It says it's a stencil game. It's like the same with Unity. When you um, build the app, mm -hmm. you then have a copy of the build that you separately upload to the app store? Or um, yeah, so the process works like this. If you want to upload something, you have to use the iOS tools, obviously. So you have to use the application loader and therefore you have to build the IPA, so the game file, and the tool uh, exports to native, I, uh, to native Xcode projects. So you have your Xcode project, which you can like compile and then use the right. application and loader. Uh, yeah, so so uh, publishing without a subscription to Stencil is not possible. Yeah, that's the problem. No, only only Flash. I mean, you can do Flash games. But if your subscription expires, it will still not be possible. Oh yeah, that's a super specific question. So the guy John who <coughs> make, who's making this tool is super active in the forum. You can even write him an email. I guess you can answer your question. So if you take a look, but normally you have on specifically on iOS you have two sites, right? You have iOS subscription, you have the de yeah, yeah. developer thing, and you have the stencil thing. So yeah. two two things that you need actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>